Hello everyone, welcome back to our week 7 graduate statistics, University of Cincinnati. Let's dig into sampling variability one more time with filling. So imagine that we decided um, to study, as we've worked on before, um, uh, the gender discrimination um, topic. So we sampled from the population of all managers Imagined, imagine that we sampled 42 managers and to 21 we gave um, a female file, 21 received a male file and so that's a, a sample of 41 managers, right? So we gave them the files to make the decision and we computed the, a sample statistic, the difference in promotion um, decisions and we found, for instance, a 30% difference in promotion decision that's a sample statistic right and then we sampled again from the population right of managers and then we can find a sample statistic again and maybe it's not exactly 30 percent maybe it's a little different and if we sample again another sample of managers and we look at the sample statistic we expect that it will vary again and if we sample again and we compute the sample statistic we expect that it will vary again right and each sample will have its distribution right however many percentage that decided to promote percentage that decided not to promote that's a sample distribution each sample has its own distribution but if we compute the sample statistic over and over and over again and if we do that like a thousand times such like we did with the random experiment we then can have a distribution of the sample statistic that's called sampling distribution. So sample distribution, that's how data distributes in a sample. And in this case, we have just two possibilities, promote, not promote. So you have a particular percentage of decisions uh, to promote and not promote in each sample. But then if we compute a sample statistic, such as the difference between promotion decisions, and we repeat that sampling process over and over again, we have a sampling distribution. And we looked at the sampling distribution expected under random conditions when we ran the random experiment. So those two things are different. And the idea is that it would be nice if we want to understand how much variation we can expect uh, to have um, if we sample over and over again, we need to somehow reconstruct the sampling distribution from the data that we have of one sample, right? You don't hear researchers going around and running the experiment a gazillion times in order to be able to compute the sampling distribution. What we try and do in our challenge is to get sample data and be able to get a sense for the sampling distribution because that's the one that will tell us how much variation we can expect in our sample statistic of interest if we were to sample over and over again, is it possible to do that? The answer is yes. And here is just one more example. Imagine I want to know the height of uh, women in the United States. So our population is every single woman in the United States. So there is a true mean, that's a prop population parameter, there is a true mean height in the population. And there is a true variation or standard deviation of height in the population. Those are true parameters in the population. If I sample from the population over and over again, imagine I get first a sample of females in Alabama. I get a thousand females there. And then I'll have an average height for women in Alabama. And then I keep sampling in alphabetical order women from a variety of different states. And then I get, say, to North Carolina, I get another sample of a thousand females and I get a height for each one of the females. And then I compute the average. And I move on, I continue on, and then I get to Wyoming and I get the height of a thousand women, uh, women that I randomly sampled and I compute the average height of Wyoming females. So for each one of my samples, I have a distribution of heights. I can look at the data and plot the histogram and see how 
the sample data is distributed and that, you know, for large enough samples, it'll, it will approach the distribution of the population. But I also have means for all of the 50 states. So I have 50 means and I can look at the distribution of these means. And while the height will be expected to vary quite a bit in the sample, the means are going to be, because we don't have any expectation that the heights differ across the country, we would expect that the differences here, the variation in, in the average heights across the different states is much tighter, um, much less variable than the variation in heights uh, in the different samples. So again, we can look at the sampling distribution if we were to sample over and over again. But the idea when you run an experiment is to actually not do the over and over and over sampling. You should be able to just sample one time and get to that sampling distribution. And have, so the sampling distribution again has the goal of telling us how much we can expect our estimate of the population, say the average height, to vary if we were to sample over and over again. Now, the nice thing is that if we take the mean of all the means, if we were to sample multiple times, the means of all the means is expected to be close to the mean of the population, is expected to approach the mean of the population, right? So that's good. But the standard deviation of the means and again, the standard deviation of the means is what we call standard error and is what is, gives us some expression of the sampling variability is expected to be smaller than the standard deviation of the population. And that kind of makes sense because in the population as a whole, we're going to have the short, the short people and the tall people. The very short, the very tall, so they expect to vary. But if we compute the mean, the center of the distribution of the population over and over again through multiple samples, that center won't tend to vary as much from sample to sample. Uh, so the standard deviation of the means, which the term that we call that standard deviation of the means, um, standard error, tends to be smaller than that of the population. And plus, the larger the sample, the smaller the standard deviation, the standard error tends to be, right? Because think about this. If I get a sample of only 50 females per state, do you think we're going to get a stronger or a weaker estimate of the mean of the population? Probably weaker, right? It will tend to vary more from sample to sample to sample to sample if the sample is very, very small, not very representative, right? It's more likely that we'll have a concentration of short females or tall females, and then we end up getting more variation. The larger the sample, the more on target the mean will be each time I estimate. So the smaller the standard deviation of the means will be, the smaller the standard error. So the margin of error will tend to be smaller. The margin of error in estimating the mean will tend to be smaller the higher the sample size. Now let's see this in practice by using the, this app, going to this, this website. If you go to the PDF that I give you of this presentation and click here, we're going to go to uh, this app where we're going to play around with doing multiple samples, getting multiple samples, and assessing this impact of sample size on the variation of the mean of the different samples. So let's go there. I'll see you there in a bit. So here is the Shiny app. And I want you to please click here on samples because we're going to pretend we're sampling from a parent distribution that's normal. Imagine heights of females are distributed normally in the population. And females have, let's just make it up, an average height of five feet, just right on target. If we were, and let's say we have a standard deviation here of, I don't know, of two, okay? 
um, I'm just making this data up. I, I don't know what's the true distribution of female height in the population. But imagine I were to take a thousand samples of uh, 50 females each time. Okay, so it's sample size that's not very large. Here are the multiple samples, sample one, sample two, sample three, all the way to a thousand. For each sample, I can compute the mean and the standard deviation. And this is the histogram, the sample distribution of heights, right? So you see that five is kind of more frequent the other, than other heights. So this is the distribution. And it will tend to get closer and closer to the distribution, the normal distribution of the population, the larger the sample size. We just got a 50 uh, sample size. Um, but if you look at the multiple samples, we don't expect the mean to be five on target each time. We expect it to vary. 505, 522, 478, 429, so on and so forth, right? And we are after, if we were to plot to get a histogram of all the thousand means, let's look at the sampling distribution. If we were to get the, the distribution of means, we'll see that the mean is pretty close to the mean of the population, which is five. That's what I said on the slide. If you get the sampling distribution, if you were to random, you know, repeatedly sample from the population, get your statistical estimate and get the mean of those means in this case, you see that it's pretty close to the population mean. But the standard deviation is less than the standard deviation of the population. We said the standard deviation of the population is two. Note that the standard error, which is the variation expected in the mean if I sample over and over again, is smaller than that. So that's the first thing I said. The other thing I said is that the standard error will be smaller the larger the sample size because the estimate of the mean will be tighter. So let's make the sample size much bigger so we can watch that happening. Let's now, instead of getting samples of 50, let's get samples of 300. So if we sample over and over again this time, the first thing we're noticing is that each sample distribution looks a lot like a normal distribution because it approaches the distribution of the population more and more, the more, the larger my sample. And the other thing is that every single mean is much closer to the mean of five. So I'm getting better at getting my mean estimate. And again, if I look at the sampling distribution, the mean again is 501, very close to the mean of the population, right? If I got samples of 50 or samples of 300, the variation in the mean of the means will be very little. But look at the standard error of the estimated means. When I got samples of 50, that standard error was 0.27 or something. We can even go back here and, and check it out. So if I get samples of 50, I have a variation in the means I estimate every time of 0.29. If I go higher, and now get samples of 300, this drops, right? It gets, the variation in my mean estimates, in my statistical estimate, gets smaller and smaller. I get more and more precise. My margin of error is smaller and smaller, the larger my sample size is. If I go even higher here, it will keep going down and it will keep going down, right? So there is a relationship there between my capacity estimate more precisely something about the population using my sample that depends on the sample size. This is sort of obvious, but it's, it's kind of nice to, to demonstrate. Now we'll come back to try and see how we can, we can in, try and estimate that variation without having to actually go in and sample multiple times, because obviously that's not what researchers do. So because we know those relationships, uh, it makes it possible to mathematically try to estimate um, that, um, that variation. We'll see that next video. Bye-bye.